the sort of shenanigans in Canberra were unfolding a few weeks ago, I sort of wondered how Winston Churchill's famous we, we shall fight them on the beaches speech might be adapted to life in Canberra for our federal politicians. And this is what I came up with. So I'm going to refer to my notes for this one. We shall fight, this, we shall fight on the sails of the Opera House. We shall fight in the strawberry patch. We shall fight them in the stories leaked to Shari Markson at the Daily Telegraph. And in sycophantic interviews with Alan Jones in the 2GB studio, we shall fight them in the party room and in the restaurants of Kingston, Marnica and Griffith. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, we were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the restaurants of O'Connor, Dixon and Lyman, of Belconnen, Woden and Tuckerenong, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to rescue and liberation of the old. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I think it speaks to the ways in which so much of our politics has in fact been trivialised. I mean, you could almost see the look of glee on the face of Scott Morrison when the strawberry thing came along. I can be a statesman. I can talk about needles in strawberries. What would, under anything other than a dysfunctional political system, have been nothing more than an ordinary matter of the criminal law to be dealt with, probably at the state level, becomes a great matter of national moment. And really what I want to talk about is the ways in which this kind of incident is feeding into a broader distrust in politics. Um, we have a lot of survey data now on trust in Australian politics. Uh, multiple surveys, some of them national, some international. Virtually all of them not only point to low trust, but trust that's continuing to decline. So I think here of something called the Edelman Trust Barometer, for instance, which has been collecting data from a number of countries, and not only about political trust, but trust in other institutions like non-government organisations, uh, you know, trust in business, trust in the media. And what's striking about that um, is that from 2017 to 18, you won't be surprised to hear that there was a massive dive in trust involving the United States, the, the largest ever, the largest ever decline in trust in the 18 or so years that that particular survey has been carried out. But what I found striking about the Australian case, I mean, yes, you can speculate about why that might have been. I don't think there are too terribly many mysteries about that. What's striking about the Australian case is that, once again, political trust declined in Australia. Once again, 2017 to 18, although a majority of countries that were surveyed actually had increased trust on this barometer, Australia's continued to dive. Um, the surveys, again, are very interesting on this. Um, they suggest, and I'm, I'm thinking here of the Australian Election Survey, which is done here at the ANU, but also work that's been done by the Scanlon Foundation at Monash University, which also surveys on political trust. And what's striking about these is they suggest that there is a sensitivity to the general national political mood. So a good example of this is in 1996, when there was a change of government and indeed uh, a landslide against the Keating government that brought John Howard to power, there was a rapid increase in, in levels of trust under uh, well, the AES, for instance. You know, so the Australian election study suggested that it went up quite rapidly, admittedly diving thereafter. The same thing happened though in 2007. Okay, so again, change of government, uh, Howard kicked out, Rudd comes in. Again, the figures, the, the statistical data from these kinds of surveys suggests the political trust went up. I guess it's a kind of function of hope, isn't it? You vote in a new government, you reckon they'll actually make a difference. What's really interesting about 2013 is the trend was not maintained. That is, you had what was effectively a landslide in 2013. 
the second Rudd government kicked out, Abbott comes to office, it has absolutely no appreciable impact on political trust as measured certainly by the Australian election study which looks at each particular election. And I think that's really interesting. That suggests that we're not dealing at this stage with something that can simply be dismissed as cyclical. Okay, so I think up to, you know, probably about that point, you could have said there's a cycle going here. Governments come in and there's a lot of hope for them. A sense of political trust goes up. It probably never quite goes up to where it was before. And that's true of when Rudd came to office. It wasn't as high as it was when, uh, when uh, Howard came to office in 96. But what's striking is you get absolutely no sign of a recovery of general political trust when Abbott came in. And I think the only explanation that I can think of is that what happened when Labor came to office in 2007, and particularly, I think, after the overthrow of Kevin Rudd in 2010, not only affected everyday party politics, but it affected broader trust in the political system. And, and you know, if you have a look again at, um, for instance, the Scanlon Foundation survey results on you know, the period of the Gillard government around 2012, they're absolutely at bargain basement levels. They go down to incredibly low levels. And I, I, you know, again, I think this is very much a, a part of a, a downward trend, which you know, you'll get recovery from time to time, but we're no longer dealing with something that looks like it's cyclical. So that's what you know, the political scientists uh, um, and the surveyors and the pollsters have to tell us. They refer to declining trust. Do historians have anything to offer to this story? Or you know, I, I suppose I'd add to historians anyone really engaged in the various forms of qualitative research. So I'm thinking here of social researchers such as you know, Hugh McKay years ago or Rebecca Huntley in the more recent past. Uh, the kind of work that basically is done with focus groups which listens to the voice or the voices of ordinary people about the political system. Again, what's striking about this, and Rebecca Huntley has, has recently reported on her findings working for Ipsos in all those years with essentially going into people's living rooms and talking to them, is that they track very precisely what the, the quantitative findings are saying. So she found that when Rudd was elected in 2007, people who'd kind of given up on politics and had become fairly pissed off with it all were once again kind of interested. They were interested in the possibilities of a new government. Some people were excited by the possibilities. And that when Rudd disappointed and then when he was overthrown, that was essentially dissipated. And, and you know, her conversations with ordinary Australians pointed very much in that kind of direction. Uh, so I think social researchers have really interesting things to say because they give a kind of what I'd call a, a, an ethnographic depth. We actually get to hear, you know, what it is that's actually pissing people off in a way that doesn't quite happen in the more quantitative work. The quantitative work registers some fairly blunt attitudes, whereas the, the qualitative work, I think, adds a great deal of texture to that. Um, so if I can give you one example, actually. So here is an example coming from some political scientists. Um, okay. Here's a woman who um, a couple of political scientists had interviewed back in the 1980s and then returned to in about 2003. So they actually were able to interview at two different periods. Back in the 1980s, she was making her way. She, she you know... Um, she and her husband established a family business. They weren't terribly well off. Um, but here she is, I'm gonna read this quote. This is um, her during the Howard years, basically the middle of the Howard years. And she's asked by these political scientists, Judy Brett and Anthony Moran, you know, what, 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 what issues do you think are important? What, what matters to you as an Australian? This is how she replied. Not me, not me. I tend to go along with whatever the decision that's made. It's a bit beyond me. I'm only a little homebody. I'm happy to do what I do, administer in the office. If it's finances, I'm happy to delve into it. Oh, I read about it and I change my mind from election to election when I'm voting because I tend to look to the leader or look at the leader. I always think the leader of the ship makes a big difference. Who did I vote for last time? 
probably little Johnny Howard, the Liberals, which I've probably done mostly. Now, it seems to me that's really interesting. Um, here's someone who could very easily have responded to a quantitative survey, but would we have got all of that from her response? Well, of course we wouldn't have. What, and what do we learn from that? We learn that this is someone who is a bit disengaged, perhaps, from everyday politics, but she's not uninterested. She's certainly not unintelligent. I mean, I think that's pretty clear from what she says, but politics perhaps occupies the margins of her consciousness. But it's interesting that what she says reflects a very important finding of things like the Australian election study, and that is about the importance of political leadership. Okay, the pre process of the presidentialisation, for instance, of elections, the ways in which voters see the leader almost as a kind of um, the brand of the political party. So the, the, the leader, the, the ability of a leader to instil confidence is a function in many ways of the ways in which people look at the policies of political parties. Most ordinary people, you know, they don't go through detailed policy uh, documents. They probably don't even read newspaper articles that deal in policy with detail, but they see the leader as somehow standing for a, a broader sense of what that party will do when it gets into office. And we get that in that kind of statement in a way that is certainly reflected in quantitative data, but I don't think we, we get the same kind of texture. Um, so I think there's a real um, place for this sort of thing. What about historians? What do we have to offer? So we're not social researchers, but I think we do replicate some of the, the kinds of methods that social researchers engage in. I mean, something I've been doing in my research in the relatively recent past is I've been looking at ordinary constituents, ordinary Australians, writing letters to Prime Minister Menzies in the 1950s. There are thousands of them over in the National Library. And, you know, I'm using that, if you like, to try and excavate a political culture in Australia in the 1950s. So I think that's not unlike the kinds of focus group research or social research that someone like Rebecca Huntley would do. So what do we, we have to offer to this? Well, the first thing I'd say about Australian democracy in this kind of context of political trust is Australian democracy is very precocious. It happens early by international standards. Manhood suffrage happens early. It's basically in place by, you could say, by 1860. And of course, women's suffrage too happens very early by Australian standards. It's in place by 1910. Other aspects of democratisation also occurred very early here. Um, one of the most important, we underestimate, and indeed we sometimes now see it as a part of the problem with politics, is payment of parliamentarians. But of course you couldn't stand for office and you couldn't stay there for any length of time if you were a poor person, if you were a poor man. Um, we are effectively talking about men in that period. Um, but Australia has payment of members of parliament early by international standards. Victoria had it by 1870, okay, and has had it ever since. Uh, the other uh, colonies basically had it by the 1890s. New South Wales, it's the end of the 1880s. Now, you might think, well, what's the relevance of this? Well, it gave rise at a very early stage to complaints about bloody professional politicians, careerists. They're only in it for the money. They're only in it for the perks. Those sorts of arguments happen in Australia very early, it seems to me. You know, Britain doesn't have pay payment of members of parliament until 1911. Okay, so that's you know, 40 years, basically, after the, you know, Victoria has it. And, and it seems to me that matters because it means that a lot of these kinds of ideas, that if you like, that sense of distrust of the professional politician who's only in it for themselves, happens early and it gets really deeply entrenched at an early stage. It's embedded in the political culture in Australia in a way that I don't think happens in quite the same way in other Anglophone cultures. I mean, you get the same ideas there, of course, but here it happens so early, I think, and, and particularly I think the payment of members of parliament is, was, a, was a, a real, if you like, Achilles heel in terms of trust in politics. It was necessary. You had to have it if you were going to open the parliament, if it was going to become a more inclusive place, but it always raised this particular problem of they're only in it for themselves. And of course, we're still dealing with some of the consequences of that every time a chopper, you know, leaves Melbourne to go to Geelong. 
uh, with Bronwyn Bishop in it, or other, you know, sort of uh, uh, abuses of, 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 of that sort of kind. Effectively, that is a continuation of complaints that were there in the 19th century about pay and perks. So I think that's one of the things historians have to offer. The other thing I'd point to is that in the Australian context, we have a really powerful uh, um, uh, uh, language and a, a powerful ideology, if you like, of what I'd call anti-political politics. Now, I've recently been reading, now, don't mob me in excitement at, at you know, my heroic actions, but I recently read from beginning to end the memoirs of Barnaby Joyce. Yes, I did. <laughs> I did. I began at the beginning and I worked my way through and I even had a pencil in my hand doing marginal notes from time to time. One of the notes I'd take is, geez, he, he sort of started the paragraph on this topic and then halfway through he's on another topic again and by the time we get to the end he's on a third topic. So it, it has to be said, it's not one of the great literary masterpieces of our time. But what I was struck by in it, what I was really struck by, is the anti-political politics. Barnaby's been there in Parliament, what, 15 years almost? So, it's quite some time. By any stretch of the imagination, he has morphed at some point in the recent past in some, into some kind of political insider. This man was Deputy Prime Minister. And yet this book is absolutely riddled with, you know, sort of statements about those bloody politicians. Those bloody politicians. And you sort of think, you're one of them, mate. You're one of them. And so I kind of think, okay, where does this, where does this come from? How can this kind of sleight of hand be maintained in a plausible way? But Barnaby does it all the way through. And of course, it comes from a much older tradition that is often very rural. I mean, its, it's roots in, in a lot of ways are indeed in rural politics. Um, a good example of this is in Victoria, in the very early part of the 20th century, there was a bizarre political movement called the Kyabram Movement. Kyabram's a, a, a small town, I think it's about 6,000 these days, in the Goulburn Valley of Victoria. And, you know, this political movement began in this town and basically what it wanted was drastically reduced parliament, you know, a much smaller parliament. It wanted drastically reduced bureaucracy, uh, cuts to government spending. It was a kind of retrenchment movement, I suppose you put it. And the way in which this movement kind of mobilised support was a kind of idea of the parliament against the rest of us. Us versus the politicians. But of course it too was a sleight of hand because, you know, before you could blink, dozens of politicians had jumped on the bandwagon and of course used it to displace one government, to put another government in office and to move on in the way politicians do. So it's a striking example of both anti-political political rhetoric and the ways in which this is ripe for exploitation by politicians. Um, another great example is the depression of the 1930s where this kind of thinking was very powerful in things called citizen movements or in the paramilitary organisations like the New Guard in Sydney or the Old Guard uh, that was formed in country areas. You know, essentially men with guns arming themselves you know, in case the Communists tried to take over or in case the New South Wales Labor Premier Jack Lang got too far ahead of himself. So, you know, th there is this quite deeply entrenched uh, rhetoric of anti-political, political thought that is kind of there and available for anyone who wants to both foster distrust of politicians as well as exploiting it for political gain. And, you know, I, I, th I think that is a part of what we've been seeing in the relatively recent past. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here with all this stuff? I and mean, it's all very well to kind of diagnose all the ills of our political system. Um, I don't think there's any straightforward uh, process of cause and effect in terms of the dreadful things that happen up on the hill and the erosion of trust. It's very difficult to trace cause and effect in that kind of situation. But I, I broadly do accept that when people say they distrust politicians, it's a broadly rational response to what they're seeing. So I often get invited to events up at the Museum of Australian Democracy at Old Parliament House. I quite enjoy them, they're nice events. Um, the Museum of Australian Democracy, I think, sees a critical part of its role as educating Australians about their democracy as a way of overcoming their distrust of the system, okay? They see 
their role as a kind of civics education. Okay, and, and, and the kind of reasoning that, that seems to underpin a lot of what they do up there, which is a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do, I think it's, it's, you can understand why they would see this as their, as their mission, is that if Australians only better understood how their political system worked, they'd be less distrustful. That is, they'd, they'd see the complexity of the system and they'd be less resentful of their politicians. Now, I have a problem with that. I would make the argument that there are actually aspects of our democracy that at the moment are extremely opaque. That is, they're not widely known or widely understood. If people did widely know them and understand them, they'd probably be even more distrustful. They'd be more distrustful of their political system. The most obvious example of this is surely the party system itself, the party system itself. Now, we, broadly speaking, still have a system of party government in Australia. When I did political science for the first time back in the 1980s, the text we read, I remember we read a book called Richard Lucy, I think it was called, The Australian Form of Government, which was a kind of standard textbook. Um, but it, was, it rose above being a mere textbook because it made, I think, the very valid argument that what we have in Australia is, a form, is party government. Okay, it's party government. That, that the parties themselves, the decisions they make, the ways they operate fundamentally shape the ways in which governance happens. And I think that, is, that insight is still broadly true, even though the parties are in a very different state today to what they were back in 1984, 85, when that kind of argument was being made. Now, back then, and indeed going all the way back really to the early part of the 20th century, but if you take it, you know, let's just take it from about 1945, the two major parties in Australia, or the two major sides of politics, I should say, Liberals and the Country Party, or the National Party as they are now on one side, Labor on the other side, broadly speaking, could count on getting about 90% of the vote at a House of Representatives election. Sometimes much better. Sometimes they wrap around 95, okay? So they had a, a virtual monopoly. They've had a virtual monopoly between them, or a duopoly, you would say, a bit like the old airlines, on, on, on the Australian vote. Now, that has clearly broken down. We know from the 2016 election that it's getting towards one in four voters in House of Representatives elections are voting uh, for minor parties or independents. And, of course, for the Senate, I think it's up around uh, about a third. It's even, it's even higher. So that is a major shift. And I would argue that that is another marker of distrust in politics. Now, um, I wouldn't want to suggest for a moment that... Uh, you know, the, the fact that people vote for independents or minor parties rather than major parties is a straightforward case of distrust. But think about the ways in which those minor parties and independents make their case. Okay, they foster a sense of disillusionment with the major parties. If you place this in the context of their own political tactics, their own political rhetoric, and I'm thinking here obviously of the Greens, but also the various rural independents, Again, the fact that people are turning away from those major parties, I think, is a marker of uh, a broader distrust. Um, it seems to me that if we're looking at why that happened and how it happened, the 1980s matter a great deal. I mean, it's obviously a period I'm very interested in, but the critical election, I reckon, in all this is 1990, a very an almost forgotten election now. No one remembers, oh, God, remember the 1990 election, how exciting that was. Hardly anyone remembers it. They probably remember 1993 because of Keating and, you know, the sweetest victory of them all and all that sort of stuff. 1990 is, to my, my way of thinking, probably the most important election of the last 40 or 50 years. Why do I think that? Because Labor won that election, Labor won that election with less than 40% of the primary vote. Okay, they won it essentially from a, a bunch of people who voted for them grudgingly. Okay, they gave their primary vote to someone else and eventually the preferences got back to the Labor Party. Now, a vote of under 40% for a major political party at any point up to then would be a landslide against you. I mean, that's the kind of vote that Whitlam got back in 1975 or 77. Okay? By 1990, a primary vote of under 40% had become a winning vote in a federal election. That looks forward to our own times and not back to the 1970s, 60s and 50s. And I, I think that 
was very much a response to the changes that had occurred in Australian life during the 1980s. The winding back of a kind of protectionist state, that is, a state that people look to to protect them against global forces. The winding back of the welfare state. A, kind, a sense that uh, the capacities of government were being deliberately run down by politicians themselves. Now, we know there were good reasons for many of the reforms of the 1980s, that a lot of the instruments that had been used uh, were no longer working terribly well. But what I don't think was fully understood during the 1980s is that whatever impact that was going to have on economics, it was going to have some serious impacts on politics, and particularly the ways in which citizens interacted with the state. And I think we're still dealing with the consequences of that, if you like, reconfiguration of the ways in which people relate to government. So I'd see that the 80s and, and to some extent the 90s as a really critical juncture in that. Let me just finish up by talking about where we might go from here. Now, I think it's an implication, surely, of what I've had to say up to this point, that political party reform actually matters. Political party reform matters. And when people talk about what the solutions to any particular uh, problem of distrust might be, they don't always look to the political parties. They often look elsewhere. So in this university and beyond it, we have some really powerful and influential theorists of deliberative democracy, for instance. And I accept all of the arguments, or many of the arguments that they've put about the importance of setting up structures that allow greater inclusion, that allow people to confer with one another, to debate issues rationally, to bring issues to bear that uh, are marginalised or excluded from mainstream politics. I'm very impressed too, I have to say, something that I think is often underestimated by the increasing importance of the Royal Commission as a political instrument. I'm not talking here about a political instrument for managing some difficult problem, although it does that. But look at the way in which our Royal Commissions are increasingly arenas for the recognition of stories and experiences that basically don't make it into, fed, in, into mainstream politics. The sexual abuse of children in institutions, banks riffing, ripping off people. Um, and this, you know, there's been examples of this going back to the 70s, but we perhaps underestimate the power of the Royal Commission. When we talk about disillusion of politics, I don't think people are disillusioned with Royal Commissions. But they're a part of politics. They're kind of arm's length of government. The government set them up. Governments receive the report. They might have a judicial approach or a semi-judicial approach, but they are actually an aspect of the way in which we relate to the political system. So I think it's worth keeping those in mind as, as a kind of a part of, of a, you know, a democratic system that's evolving and changing in relation to new demands. But I think, you know, I do come back to the importance of political party reform. Political parties now have tiny rank and file memberships, all of them. Okay, they don't have large numbers of members. They never did in Australia, to be fair. Australia didn't really have mass parties on the European model. But, you know, we're talking about political parties now that, broadly speaking, you know, kind of have officials and politicians and relatively few rank and file members. And that has created all sorts of problems in terms of accountability. It's given enormous power to individuals within those parties, uh, you know, who sometimes will block votes at conventions and at conferences and things like that, who exercise enormous power over things like pre-selections. Um, it becomes harder and harder to make an argument for democratic, uh, you know, pre-selection if you don't have members of political parties. You know, it delegitimises uh, those parties as democratic instruments. So it seems to me that as long as we have a system where, broadly speaking, at every election, you really ask the kind of simple question about government, and the question is, which of these two do you want to govern you? It's still, I mean, that hasn't changed. Okay, that was the story back in 1910, and it's still the story. Okay, well, there isn't really a third option. Okay, we get minority government, okay, we had, what, two in the last 70 or 80 years. But broadly speaking, that is still the question that we're all answering at a federal election. And it seems to me while that is essentially what we're faced with at federal elections, we need to look at how parties are governed and how they're organised. And of course, what, what is happening is that the bad behaviour within those parties does begin to seep into other institutions and it certainly seeps into Parliament. 
as we saw recently, really, with the, the, the leadership crisis in Canberra, where yeah, there were stories of MPs being bullied and indeed of, of you know, non-parliamentarians, but you know, kind of machine men, if you like, coming into the parliament to lay down the law to MPs about pre-selection. So it seems to me that reform of political parties remains absolutely central to the restoration of, of trust. They are very difficult to reform because they are now so oligarchic. Okay, but that, it seems to me, is one of the central dilemmas we face. And if we don't face it, we're going to find ourselves with, you know, likely continuing down, you know, downward slide of trust in our political institutions. So I just leave it there. Thank you.